So I was arguing with the guy and he was talking about how the enclosure movement led to the starvation and I'm thinking to myself, what planet does this guy actually live on? Uh, the economic conditions prior to 1760, not only in Great Britain, but in every other country I've named and all the other countries in existence, uh, was one of dire poverty by modern standards. The people, the masses of people, lived on the brink of starvation. Uh, as a matter of fact, famines periodically swept all the countries of Europe and Asia. Death, the death rate was high. Death was a constant recurrence uh, because of the fact that there simply wasn't enough to eat. The major diseases at that time were diseases related to, uh, to diet. That is, there were diseases of malnutrition, such as scurvy and beriberi and rickets and uh, things of this sort that decimated the populations. What put a stop to those periodical famines was the enclosure movement. An example of that was in 1607, the pilgrims in the United States, or what would, would become the United States, of course, uh, in Jamestown in the Virginia colony. The first American settlers arrived in Jamestown in May of 1607. There in the Virginia Tidewater region, they found incredibly fertile soil and a cornucopia of seafood, wild game such as deer and turkey, and fruits of all kind. Nevertheless, within six months, all but 38 of the original 104 Jamestown settlers were dead, most having succumbed to famine. He then goes on to say, Two years later, the Virginia Company sent 500 more recruits to settle in Virginia. And within six months, a staggering 440 were dead by starvation and disease. This was appropriately known as the Starving Time. Then, Britain had sent across Sir Thomas Dale uh, to assess the problem. And Sir Thomas Dale immediately identified the problem and that was communal ownership of, of land, basically. That was the problem. It was faced with the free rider problem. I could go into that information. If you would like to learn more, I can give you the source to that information. You fast forward more than 200 years later into the 1920s of the Soviet Union. It centralized agriculture, and what happened? Millions died of starvation, again, Every communist movement on the face of the planet Earth that centralised agriculture led millions to their death in terms of starvation. A great example of that was China in between 1959 and 1962 in the Great Leap Forward where more than 30 million people died of starvation in the year 1960 because of the centralisation of agriculture. Despite this historical evidence, there was that guy sitting, arguing with me, somebody in his 50s for Christ's sakes, basically saying I'm talking rubbish and trying to claim that the privatisation of land uh, somehow caused the starvation. Well, it's rather quite funny that because when the enclosure movement happened, you've not seen a famine in Great Britain ever since. And the Irish potato famine was nothing at all to do with the enclosure movement in Britain. Do you want to know what the English, what would have happened to the English working class uh, with the population explosion if there had been no Industrial Revolution? Then go to Calcutta. Uh, or, closer to home, go to Ireland in the 19th century. There was a society that increased also in population tremendously by about the same rate that the British did. And they were fortunate enough not to be subjected to those dark satanic mills. Uh, they were lucky. So that, when the potato crop failed in 1845, there was nothing. So, I mean, you could go on and on, and there are so many examples. The African continent, when it flirted with Marxism and Leninism, that's the real world of socialism, um, the democratic socialism of Venezuela that led them from 99th on the Freedom Index, you know, declined right to 176th and they ended up, you know, faced with all the food shortages and everything and because they, they, they love to blame the United States of America on this, right? I know the United States is not exactly perfect but 
the United States of America was never at fault for why uh, the, the the food shortages had occurred. And we can turn our attention to the history of Chile to show for that. The reason why is because Chile in 1970, communist Allende took over, he heavily nationalised the economy. He began the price fixing and the, the wage controls and all the rest of it. In 1970, with the support of Cuba's Fidel Castro, Chile elects the first communist president in the Western world. Salvador Allende immediately nationalizes basic industries and controls prices and wages. And as a result of his price fixing, in other words, a price ceiling, he ended up causing a you know, food shortage. And because of all the shortages, they were faced with a serious problem. Under uh, Allende, uh, the rate of increase in prices uh, annualized uh, of the month of September 73 was 1,000%, 1,000%. Therefore, typical of socialism, when you run out of other people's money, because that's what Margaret Thatcher said, and she was right in what she quoted saying, when you run out of other people's money, and you end up in a crisis, you've got no other choice but to run the printing press. That's exactly what happened. They ran the printing press and they hit hyperinflation in 1972. You did not see the likes of the CIA and the United States getting involved in Chile until late 1973. On September 11th, 1973, General Augusto Pinochet leads a military coup against Allende. It is covertly supported by the United States. Pinochet and his generals bomb the presidential palace. Allende is either murdered or commits suicide. So their whole argument on blaming the United States of America, to, uh, you know, their desperate attempt to say, oh, it was all the United States of America's, you know, fault in their intervention that caused the shortages. Absolute nonsense, folks. The shortages were already there long before that period. So that's a perfect example in history to look at. And, and this is the thing, with their level of denial, like I said earlier on with regards to Hong Kong, I don't get why they stand against economic success. It doesn't make sense to me, to be perfectly honest with you. When Chile moved towards a free market, it was the fastest growing economy of South America and lifted the masses out of poverty. Yes, there was still poor people existing by 2000. It was vastly different to, to what the country was like living in uh, in the 1970s. You know, it improved um, their life so much that so many people who used to support socialism now defend capitalism. Even Michelle Bachelet conceded to the success of the free market. But what's important out of this is the fact that when you point out the economic success of Chile between 1984 to 2006, when you point out that economic success, what does the socialist do? The socialist points out about Augusto Pinochet killing 3,000 people. What on earth has Augusto Pinochet killing 3,000 people got to do with the economic success of the free market between 1984 and 2006? Absolute nothing. Real world socialism has not only shown that it's led to the deaths of countless millions of people. An estimated 100 million people died of starvation because of it. Countless millions massacred because of it. That's what you have to find remarkable about these people who support Marxism. And even if you've got people in that crowd who are sitting listening to Jeremy Corbyn, who think it's all about just striking the right balance between capitalism and socialism, they still don't have a leg to stand on. They don't have a leg to stand on because, as I say, when you look at the history, it doesn't matter what they say. The, the most strongly free economies from government intervention have proven the most successful, especially regarding equality, which is why Sweden lifted the masses out of extreme poverty, had high levels of equality, never had the big extensive welfare state, had extremely low levels of government regulation, 
and they became the fourth richest nation per capita GDP in the world. Sweden has not always been the country of the welfare state and high tax rates. My country became rich many decades ago when we embraced the principles of the free market. The golden age of economic growth in Sweden began around 1870 and lasted about a hundred years. During that period, real per capita income rose sevenfold, giving Swedes the fourth highest per capita income in the world by 1970. And yet as soon as they laid on the high tax rates, the strong government regulation, the big extensive welfare state, what happened to Sweden? Well, they began to stagnate and drop down to the 14th richest nation per capita GDP in the world. That tells you something that it, history is so strongly opposed to them. As a proponent of free market capitalism, I don't sit here and, and make you promises. I don't sit here. I, 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 in other words, I don't sit here and, 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 and talk off the basis of something theoretical. I'll sit here and tell you that Hong Kong was a great success that there's no such thing as an economy without rich and poor people, that there's no such thing as an economy without exploitation. The mindset of the socialist is just so utopian, it's so far outside the bounds of human nature and reality. Wow, the land of make-believe. You could point out the great success of Hong Kong, for example, where in 1950, it had an average household income of less than $5,000, but today it has an average household income of more than $55,000 plus. The masses were living in extreme poverty in 1950, but if you compare the poor today, the average poor person today in Hong Kong is living far better off than what they were 50, 60 odd years ago. But for some strange reason, that is viewed as a failure. So what what exactly are they looking for? Are they looking for something that just does not exist? In other words, pure perfection, where 100% of people are out of poverty and 100% of people all have Ferraris in their driveways? That That's what I mean. And if you ask them for an alternative, get them, sit them down and ask them a question Ask them to point out an alternative to Hong Kong sh and, and, and get them to, to, to point to you an example where the masses are living better off than what Hong Kong achieved. And I'll tell you this, when it comes to even their most desperate attempt to turn towards countries like Sweden, Norway or Denmark, they're not as, they're, they're not, they're not as well off as they like to have you believe. <laughs>